Good afternoon. It's just an honor and a pleasure to speak today on behalf of all the educators in the International Educators Hall of Fame. This is the 25th year, the Silver Jubilee of this International Educators Hall of Fame. Why do we do it? Because there's so many educators who are unsung heroes. They are often pioneers, they're movers and shakers, they're creators, they're historians, and they're humanitarian in nature. So we decided 25 years ago to honor some of the educators who are unsung heroes. We put out the request and people responded. They gave personal accounts to why this person deserved it. What are the criteria? One, you've been in the field of education at least 20 years or you're retired from the field of education and while there, you did more than the call of duty. You don't have to say it yourself, but people know if you fit that criteria. So many names came in. We never knew we were going to be doing it 25 years later. We've done it in Egypt five times. We've done it in Nigeria, West Africa two times. We've done it in Memphis, Tennessee, in the Bay Area, in Orange County, and we started that many years ago right here in Sacramento and Orange County. So we want to say to everyone, say thank you to those educators that made an impression in your life, that motivated you, that inspired you, and that you know in your heart they deserve to be thanked. Have a good day. We'll see you soon. And please... Send us your nominations for people into the International Educators Hall of Fame. Visit us on our website. It is educatorshalloffame.org. Educatorshalloffame.org. Have a good day. We'll see you. Visit our website. And don't forget to give donations. They help us do what we need to do, honor educators. Hello, my name is Travis Parker. I am co-founder of the Alpha Academy. Alpha Academy is a mentoring group for young men uh, age 18, well, 12 to 18. And uh, our main focus is African-American young men and the reason we started the Alpha Academy. There were actually two of us, John Taylor and myself. And our fraternity gives scholarships to students and we noticed that we weren't getting as many young men as we were young women. And so we had a tutoring session at Valley High School with several students, males and females. And uh, that's when we started the Alpha Academy. And uh, at our first session in uh, South Sacramento, we had two young men show up. They were my cousins. I had not seen them before that. Well, I saw them the day before at a funeral. And then uh, after that particular academy session, I never saw them again. Uh, they never came back. And so we kept showing up to the academy uh, month after month. And eventually, it, the following started to grow, and now we get uh, from 30 to 40 young men once a month. We do it during the school year from September to May. Uh, formerly, I was an educator at Kasumnas River College for 41 years. I coached soccer, cross country, and track, men and women, and I taught uh, contemporary problems of athletes. And somebody might say, well, what's a contemporary problem of athletes? One, one problem of some athletes is that they think they're going to make their living in athletics. And for the vast majority of people who play athletics in junior high, high school, or even college, less than 1% of college athletes earn a living 
in uh, athletics. And for that small percentage that do, they only do it for a number of years. So by the time they're uh, 30, 35 years old, they're no longer in that vocation. Uh, the other thing I do presently is raise scholarships uh, to give to young students. And we do that through the Martha Parker Gospel Concert at Kasumnas River College. Thank you. My name is Amagda Perez, and for me, it's one of the greatest honors to be inducted into the International Educators Hall of Fame. I think as educators, one of the greatest um, accomplishments or impacts that we can have is when we can um, help students reach their potential and then follow their careers and see them become excellent professionals. I think for me, as an educator, one of the most important accomplishments is to be able to talk to the hearts of the students who sometimes believe that they don't have what it takes to be successful in law school, and then to guide them and watch them become not only excellent professionals, but also to become mentors and those role models that keep young generations um, in the fields that are so greatly needed um, to help our communities. So I am very appreciative of the opportunity to be part of this amazing network of educators who put their heart and soul into ensuring that we have a future of young students who will continue to fight for our communities. Thank you. Um, my name is Courtney Tesler. And I've been a counselor for 44 years. Most recently, I was at Davis Senior High School for 22 years. In the last eight, I was head counselor. But when I initially started working as a counselor, I worked with the migrant, the Papago, the Pima, and the Navajo Indians in Casa Grande, Arizona. I also worked with disabled students. I was a drug and alcohol counselor. I worked with female offenders, and I had a private practice for 15 years. My personal philosophy is that the whole field of counseling and education is very vibrant. There's a lot of opportunities to help students and adults to learn about the world around them and to navigate this world. Everyone has potential to do the best they can and be the best they can. We all have talents, we all have strengths, and we all have weaknesses. Sometimes you need that counselor to help you to figure out exactly what those are and to problem solve and put yourself in the right direction. Um, advice to young people, I would say to follow your passions, take time to really know what appeals to you, what your talents are. Um, give back to those who are less fortunate than you. As a world traveler, I try to inspire students to get out of the city they live in and to start experiencing the world and learn about different cultures. And I wish to be remembered for the fact that um, I truly helped a lot of people. I care about people. I'm very genuine in what I've done. I have enjoyed learning about the world around me, and I've enjoyed inspiring other people. My name is Willie Portis. I'm from Fresno, California. I was born February 3rd, 1949. I am an educator artist. And I'm here today to enjoy the pleasure of some of the most important people in the world are those who are inducted here with me to fellowship and to share a few of the things that I've accomplished. First of all, I um, graduated as a commercial artist, then I attended the University of Akron for fine arts. My vocational training was at, in commercial arts at Howard Vocational High. I finished all my graduate work in California in 2000. Um, in, nine, in 94, uh, and it was, uh, it was 1994, uh, in instructional leadership, a master's in education. And I worked for three different school districts, the Central Unified School District, the uh, 
West Fresno School District where I retired. And I was recruited back to work at the Big Picture High School, teaching students art uh, that they may one day become professional if they desire. And my desire is to help them become the best that they can be in the visual arts. In conclusion, I hope to inspire these students to be the best they can be. And my legacy is really to continue grooming them for the future in, in the commercial and fine arts. Because art is an absolute balance between left and right brain. And while they figure it is um, uh, not necessary, it is necessary to balance a child's development. So I will continue to help the students throughout my life. Thank you. I live in Davis, California, but I worked as a teacher in Sacramento City Unified School District where I retired after 36 years of teaching. I was nominated for the International Educators Hall of Fame by Neil Hollander, a friend who I worked with for two years while serving as vice principal at Luther Burbank High School in Sacramento. In 2013, I was inducted into the uh, International Educators Hall of Fame. I was president of the Mexican-American Concilio of Yolo County for 18 years years while awarding 1,000 scholarships to high school and college students in Yolo County. I started with two scholarships in 1998 and increased the number until over 60 scholarships were awarded each year. Concilio serves 13 high schools and two colleges in awarding multiple scholarships to each school in Yolo County. The following schools were served Woodland High School, Pioneer High School, Cash Creek High School, Esparto High School, Winters High School, Davis High School, Da Vinci Charter Academy, King High School, uh, uh, Yolo High School, Delta High School, and uh, I was Sacramento. I'm trying to think of the school. I uh, <laughs> River City High School. Woodland Community College and UC Davis were the colleges that we've given scholarships to. The Concilio fundraised over $400,000 to pay for these 1,000 scholarships. I was a teacher for 34 years and a vice principal at Luther Burbank High School for two years during my career. I coached varsity soccer at Sacramento High high school for 18 years, sending some 50 students to CSU Sacramento for playing soccer at Sac High. I helped them with their college enrollment, financial aid forms, and writing letters of recommendation. Not all graduated, but I know many did. As a special education teacher, all of my students passed the regular high school proficiency test, the same exam that all regular education students had to pass in order to graduate from high school. My special education students qualified to take an easier differential test, but I raised my standards and each student rose to the occasion. This lasted for 15 years until I left Sac High to become an administrator, a vice principal at Luther Burbank High School, also in Sacramento City Unified. I was very proud of what these special education students accomplished, that is, passing the same test that the regular students did. I have been attempting to close the achievement gap since I started teaching. My passion was to help students who needed the most help. I went the extra mile because that's what I felt they needed. I not only told them I cared about them, but my actions spoke louder than words. I tutored them after school. I made phone calls to their parents because I needed parent support to help their children. I have always wanted to help the underdog. I have always wanted to help the voiceless. My motto is, if you ask the right question to the right person at the right time, then anything is possible. There's no such thing as a bad question. I've lived in this I've lived this motto and have helped many along my journey. Now retired, I use the same motto in my daily living, still helping people in need along the way. While awarding these scholarships to students, I always tell them to become a good teacher, a good lawyer, a good construction worker, or whatever. We have too many mediocre teachers, lawyers, construction workers, etc. Dream big 
Aim for the stars. If you just hit the lamppost, you're on your way. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do this or become that. With hard work, determination, and perseverance, you can succeed. You will meet many people along your life's journey, good and bad. Remember, it is the people you meet along the way that a light bulb in your brain will light up. No one succeeds by themselves. You need to recognize these shining lights along the way. Many times you won't recognize the help that someone has given you until much, much later. It's never too late to remember to thank such a person. Finally, don't forget to give back to your community wherever you end up. Treat others the way you want them to treat you or your kids. If everyone would do this, this would be a much better world. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Jorge Garcia, and I'm a health sciences clinical professor of internal medicine at UC Davis. And uh, my personal philosophy regarding education is, uh, to quote Cesar Chavez, si se puede, that uh, if, if there's education that can be taught, it can be taught uh, to students, and if it's done in the right way, they will learn that material. Uh, my advice to young people is that they take an inventory on the gifts and the talents they have, and that they think very carefully about where they can best utilize those gifts and talents uh, to hopefully find some mentors that will help to guide them on how to best use that. Some of the best pieces of advice that my mentors gave me was um, that you should envision your ideal job. So with as much detail as you can, create the job that you would love to do, that you would do for free. That becomes your roadmap for success. And so then it's just a matter of asking for directions, asking people, how do I get there? Uh, what, what are the steps that I need to take? What are the experiences, the knowledge, the skills that I need? Um, and then another beautiful piece of advice I got, that if, if you want to be a winner, you join a winning team. So again, find the place that will set you up to succeed. Uh, and what I want to be remembered for, uh, I hope to re be remembered as a physician educator, as a person who uh, loved and encouraged uh, his patients and his students. And so um, I, I hope that uh, I'll be able to make uh, a few uh, physician educators like myself um, over the years. I, I have been able to, to see some of my students go on to become professors, so that's uh, been one of the, the greatest joys of my life. Thank you. Jack and Richard met at Eagle Rock High School in Los Angeles, California in 1947. They remained the closest of friends for the rest of their lives. Their parents were working class people. They learned from their parents the importance of always working for the underdog. Our parents were strong admi ad admirers of Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal. We both found evidence that we had some Native American ancestry. With all these things in common, including the Democratic Party, it wasn't hard for Jack and Dick to find interesting issues to fight for and their lives developed. Jack and Richard were also musicians. Jack played trombone and Richard the piano. Their interest in the blues, boogie, and Dixieland and progressive jazz led to the creation to forming a jazz group at high school. The interest in jazz led to a great respect for the contributions from African Americans. They found many sources of information that helped them understand and fight the dangers of McCarthyism. They walked precincts in 1952 in support of Adlai Stevenson and became active in the South Pasadena Democratic Club. At that point, they were 18 years old. Jack and Richard went to Glendale Community College. Uh, Jack got a scholarship to USC and Richard went to California State University. Jack earned a PhD in anthropology and Native American studies. Richard, a degree in history. Jack Forbes is the author of 17 books and many articles. He's one of the foremost experts in the world on Native American history and culture and a great advocate. Along with Richard, the for the curriculum in our public schools to better represent all of minorities as an intricate part of the story of America. Jack was responsible for the establishment of a Native American Studies Department at UCD. DQU was based upon the vision of a pan-Indian university drawn up by Jack. 
Richard taught classes and participated in the early movement for the establishment of DQU. Richard developed perhaps the first Native American Chicano Studies class in the public schools of California at Davis High School. Both Jack and Richard never stopped working together for fair history standards in our schools and the rights of all peoples. Richard was a classroom teacher for 51 years in Los Angeles, Davis, UCD, and Solano College. He also has two books of poetry. Thank you very much. I'm just 94, but my sister is 98. Yeah. My sister, she's the oldest uh, of, there were three of us. I had a good education, and it was from a... Uh, a lot of education you get from the recreation, because we had the recreation department was right across the street. Ooh, West Oakland, that was a long time ago, though. My legacy to the children now, learn all they can from their teachers and the recreation directors, too. Because in the recreation directors work with the mothers too. Everybody works together, you know. The the recreation and the schools all work together. Oh, and don't forget the church too. Church. It doesn't matter what church. They're going to learn about one famous man, and that's Jesus. So that's important too. Uh, greetings. I am Aladrian Mack, and I am a, an early childhood specialist. I uh, spent my early years as a teenager knowing that I wanted as a career uh, to be a child development person. I wa always wanted to be in that field. So when I w went off to college, I decided I needed to know everything there was to know about very young children. And I spent um, those years in college learning everything about the development of very young children and the kinds of uh, areas that were important to their growth. I taught preschool for um, a couple of years and after that I taught college students, uh, particularly college students who were interested in going into the field of early childhood education. This was probably one of my, uh, one of my joys um, that uh, I could encourage and support the needs of teachers of very young children. I later spent um, 15 years as the manager for education services for the Sacramento County uh, Head Start program, and I spent 15 years there uh, also teaching teachers and uh, teaching teachers throughout California and um, uh, in Fairbanks, uh, Alaska for uh, a, a short period of time. I um, also found um, at one point that I, w I was invited to be part of a team to evaluate um, the credentialing program of one of the state colleges in the state of California. I was invited by the state credentialing office and I discovered that the kinds of things that um, I wanted for teachers of early childhood children um, was exactly what teachers were learning in their college experience. It was um, important for me to uh, recognize where was the develop what developmental areas were the teachers need to support their learning and to support the work that they wanted uh, that they wanted to do, I also um, decided that as a retired person, how would I support the field of early childhood education? And I have done that through uh, professional organizations, specifically child development organizations. I have supported those organizations all over, uh, all over the, the country. But I also am finding now that there are other things that I think are becoming important, just as important to me, and that is the, um, the need to um, make sure that young people 
are being registered to vote, particularly young African-American girls who may not think that they have any, um, anything that they can pursue. I need to get to those young women in our community to make sure that they realize that they have many options, but they must register, they must vote. And I expect to work in that area for the next um, election. I am also very uh, fortunate, blessed to have um, some grandchildren that uh, my husband and I spend lots of time with. And we want to make sure that they understand the reasons for voting. They're, they're young now, but we want them to understand those reasons for voting. And we want them to understand the importance of service. So although I am uh, retired from the field of child development, I am certainly um, in the uh, area of teaching and training and uh, loving, um, uh, loving helping our children become a part of uh, this American scene. Uh, we all have our ups and downs. Uh, uh, ways to deal with them and is to, bo and is to bounce back. Bouncing back with community and resilience of work for me is the title of my book published last year by Amazon Books. I grew up in the Yakima Indian Reservation surrounding the town of Wapato, Washington. Over 100 Japanese immigrant families were farming on reservation land. Before immigrating to the, United, to the Yakima Valley, my father was trained as a carpenter, including an apprenticeship in Japan's Imperial Palace in Tokyo. When this became known, the immigrant community called on my father to supervise building the auditorium annex to the Wapta Buddhist temple needed for community activities. During the winter season, many farmers came to help, but with the spring planting season, father remained with a few townspeople. Our family got overgrown with weeds. Then one day, 50 farmers showed up, harvesting root crops, trucking the harvest to the packer. My parents were very grateful, but their thanks were met by their comment that you've been doing plenty to help us. It's our turn to help you. This is community. Community is people helping each other. When one gets down, the others pitch in. This lesson became part of my work, my outlook, on my life, my teaching starting, starting the graduate program in community development in Asian American studies. I've continued teaching and making other contributions to 25 years after retiring. These include facilitating the Central Valley Partnership involving 150 immigrant groups from Mexico, Laos, Cambodia, Laos, Russia, and the Azores, the Rural Development Leadership Network with rural leaders of Native Americans, Latin, Latino, and African Americans through the country, and teaching a UC summer community course in Japan that put UC students working on community projects in the Kyoto, Osaka area. This is a book of my memoirs that uh, includes many of the stories that I, I had hinted at in my discussion. So I'm Carl Mack. Um, I've had a really interesting uh, career related to education, and basically my parents, uh, I, I was the oldest of three boys, and my parents really uh, impressed us with the need to get an education. I was resistant to it in the beginning, but after spending uh, uh, some time in the service uh, during the war in Vietnam, uh, I realized how important it was to uh, get an education. And upon my return home, I was recruited to attend the University of California, Berkeley. And with that opportunity, I took advantage of it. And I finished my bachelor's, my master's, and my PhD from UC Berkeley. Probably the most uh, significant contribution that I feel that I've done in my life is I spent 22 years as a public school superintendent. Uh, 
I think I was part of my success, I believe, was that I had spent time as a manager and a consultant to uh, various uh, industries and uh, companies and different types of organizations uh, in the community. And so I knew a lot about uh, management and running uh, organizations and companies. But I didn't know about the uh, ups and downs of being a superintendent, and I found it the most inspiring and uh, important work that I've ever done in my life. And part of the reward that I got was that I was able to see students who graduated uh, from high school actually uh, get enrolled at the local universities, University of California, Davis, and uh, Cal State Sacramento and those students a most interesting experience that I've had throughout my life uh, is something like this I would uh, go and get lunch and I would be at the uh, I don't know it could be the Burger King or a restaurant and some student would come up to me and say or some person would come up to me and say hey, aren't you uh, Carl Mack? You were, you know, and I say, yes. Well, you were the superintendent of my school district. And uh, so I would say, wow, that's interesting. Uh, how have you, how's your life been? And he said, well, after I finished uh, Grant High School, I was uh, admitted to San Jose State, and so was my wife. And we both graduated from there. And now uh, we're both attorneys because we, uh, we finished law school and we're practicing law. A and I can just tell you count the stories of me running across people who uh, finished the schools in the district where I was superintendent and have actually had meaningful lives and uh, are significant contributors to our society. And uh, I, I feel proud that I was able to uh, serve in that role. Sarah Hutchinson, Cherokee, was born in Claremont, Oklahoma. She came to UC Davis as a Native American Studies faculty member in 1970, and her tenure with the uh, Native American Studies program spanned almost 25 years. As one of the founding faculty in the Native American Studies program, she was the only woman during the formative period of the academic program. As such, she provided a unique balance to the other amazing faculty who shared her drive and dedication in building Native American Studies into a rigor rigorous academic program. From the early days, Sarah pushed to build a solid academic curriculum and a critical mass of students so that the fledgling uh, Native American Studies program that was tucked into the Department of Applied Behavioral Science could become its own Native American Studies department. As an educator, Sarah's teaching style was creative, holistic, and interactive. She recognized each individual student's best learning style and made sure that her courses supported and challenged her students. Classes always included both traditional and modern texts, themes, and perspectives. She was especially emphatic that students learn the value of seeking out primary sources in their re research, including the preservation of oral histories, native languages, and tribal tr traditions. She taught students interview techniques, audio recording, and transcription, and encouraged videography as the technology as that technology became more accessible. Research and writing were two elements she pushed elements to master not just for academic excellence, but for the preservation of our cultures. Over the years, dedication and commitment to the Native American Studies program was manifest in many creative ways by the founding faculty. For example, when the program was threatened because of low class enrollments, Sarah initiated a course enrollment recruitment plan that included building a bridge with the UCD athletics department so that athlete scholars would know about the offerings and the great faculty that Native American studies offered. It didn't hurt that she also sent homemade sweetbreads to the coaches and faculty there along with course flyers. Her lifelong love of college football and UCD football in particular was very well known. Sarah had no problem engaging the coaches and players to facilitate their support to Native American studies. 
it was very creative. It was a very creative solution that helped students get needed credits and Native American studies to grow through a tough period of time. Besides teaching, challenging, and engaging courses, Sarah invited Native American leaders, activists like Dennis Banks and many other elders to speak to her student, her classes. Sarah provided hands-on learning experience in the outside community as well. For example, she brought students along when she attended the Thanksgiving sunrise ceremonies on Alcatraz Island. Sarah also strongly encouraged civic engagement by Native American students, uh, often encouraged students to become involved in student government, political advocacy, and or campus protests for human and civil rights. Sarah was a unique faculty member because she also brought the, her professional counseling skills to a fledgling uh, Native American studies program and a UC Dave, and a UC campus with very few Native American students. Her professional skills as a marriage and family counselor served the program well, and she was often sought out when students were struggling with personal or family issues. And without a doubt, Sarah often became a mediator when there were disagreements between faculty. Her doors were always open, both on campus and at her home, just north of campus on Oak Avenue. Countless students and others sat on her back porch under the annual canopy of large leafy ground vines and benefited from her teaching, counsel, and wisdom. Students, colleagues, and many others on campus today are truly fortunate to have had Sarah Hutchinson teach, counsel, and we all continue to benefit from her great dedication to helping create a strong and lasting Native American Studies program at UC Davis. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Holly Cooper, and I teach at uh, the law school here at UC Davis School of Law. And I've been teaching for about 20 years. And we teach students uh, about prisoner rights. We educate students about how to uh, defend the rights of prisoners, immigrants who are, de who are also detained. And uh, we also work on the juvenile justice system. And so the students, uh, I've probably educated over 100 students who are now lawyers who are fighting uh, for social justice, and uh, that's kind of me in a nutshell. <laughs> so uh, thank you for this opportunity and this award, and um, hopefully we can continue to educate our youth to empower incarcerated. Thank you very much. My name is Doris Mangrum, and I was inducted into the International Educators Hall of Fame in 20. 18. I'm a social justice advocate who's worked on behalf of people whose lives have been impacted by incarceration, their children and their families and their communities for 35 years. I'd like to talk about uh, the importance of leaving legacy. Our days are numbered and uh, we should be living our lives as if our last one could happen any day. And it should be important that we don't worry so much about possessions, but the quality of our lives. And in doing so, it's important for us to do a few things. And I believe that we should do, do not try. If try is in your vocabulary, it should be only to try longer, try harder, and try until we get it done. And we must convert the storms of opposition into our winds beneath our sails and sails beneath our wings, however that one goes. And so we should find ourselves and, and make a decision. Understand that it's never too late to do the right thing. It's never too late for your dreams to come true. The other thing that you want to do is to create impeccable boundaries with friends, with associations, with things that you do, with choices that you make. When you create those impeccable boundaries, it will impact the legacy that you leave. One of the crucial things is to not allow people to stand in your way, in the middle of your dreams. If someone is saying to you that you cannot do a particular thing, step over them, step under them, step around them, but move forward. So understand that because our days are numbered, and the most important one is the one that we are going to have at the end when it's all said and done, what people say about us, it's important to remember those things. So I hope that you will create the legacy that you want and that your life will be a quality one and that everything that you have dreamed of, you will have it and that you will convert your storms into opportunities and great things to happen for you as you move forward. Again, my name is Doris Mangrum, correctional educator for 35 years. Hello, my name is Kevin Russell Gibbs, and I just want to tell you a little bit about my story. 
my uh, journey in life. And uh, as you all know, everybody has one, but I just want to give you a brief synopsis of mine. Um, I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, went to Catholic schools up until the ninth grade. My family moved to uh, Georgia, Columbus, Georgia, to be exact, and uh, went to my first public school. And when I got there, I was really amazed because most of the people in my high school um, were people who wanted to um, go to college. And that was very different, um, and especially people of color. Um, there was a pride in the South that uh, was very man manifested in the character of the people. So obviously that fire caught on with me and I uh, went into the United States Air Force, did 20 years, six months and a day, retired. After that, I've been an entrepreneur ever since. I am a pastor, I'm a chaplain, and also I am a businessman. I um, have a business which is called a BPA, Business uh, Professional Administrator. And I do the same thing as AAA, uh, give people license plates and stickers and stuff like that so they don't have to stand those long DMV lines. I've owned a mortgage company and a consulting company and so many other things I've done. But if I could leave you with one thing, it would be this. Don't be defined by your culture or your ethnicity. You can be anything you choose to be because you're, you're a leader. Leaders are not made. Leaders are born. They just don't know it at the time until they're confronted with the situation that brings that leadership out in them. And I want to say to you, don't be defined because you may have been uh, poor when you grew up or your skin color, your, uh, you know, pigmentation in your skin. Many people define themselves that way, but you shouldn't because what you are is not your pigmentation. What you are is not your upbringing. What you are is not what people say about you. What you are is what you desire to be, what's intrinsic in you. And, um, and that should be the thing that you should zero in on and uh, focus on and uh, do all you can to make that, uh, sharpen those uh, skills so you can uh, be the best at what you do. I like to think of myself that way, and uh, I didn't get there alone. There were people who helped me along the way. So <clears throat> don't begrudge people who try to help you get where you need to be. You have to know, um, first of all, you have to figure out what it is that you want to be. you got to know who you are. Once you define who you are and where you want to go, then you will begin to associate yourself with people who are in that particular field or uh, mindset that they can encourage you uh, on your journey. So you have to be wise as well. You have to align yourself with people who are going in the same direction that you're going. If you want to be a lawyer, don't spend a lot of time with people who want to be counselors, although uh, being a lawyer somewhat is like a counselor, but uh, more specific than that. Um, I want you to understand that um, in this journey, this what we call life, and that's exactly what it is. You never know where you're going to end up. But I tell you what, if you keep your hand in God's hand and you stay on the straight and narrow, you will accomplish your dream. My name is Albert Wilson. I have retired from the Air Force. 20 years and 6 months, 24 days, 3 hours, 35 minutes, and 40 seconds. Retired at the age of 38. Graduated from high school. And excel in electronics. While in the Air Force, I served in Germany <clears throat> for a year and a half, two and a half years in Italy, and taught the Italian air-to-ground communication and mobile communication for the armed forces. I spent three years in Turkey on a special mission regarding invasions in the Middle East. And also I was called to duty in Vietnam and also in Thailand. I spent well over two years there and also a year in career. My last overseas assignment was the Philippines. I was chief engineer of the Armed Forces Radio and TV Service worldwide. I control Channel 8 and cover the Apollo 
mission back in the late 1900s. My last assignment was in Hollywood for four years doing the program for the Armed Forces Worldwide, recording sport package information from the White House and distribute it to the Armed Forces around the world. Once I retired from the military, I proceeded to learn license in the state of California for real estate and marketing. Governor Duke Majin appointed me as chairman of the Martin Luther King Holiday Foundation prior to any state being one to celebrate the birthday. California was first under my chairmanship along with Governor Wilson. I also built the largest health club in the state of California, over 150,000 square feet under one roof with a full Olympic-sized pool, tennis, and I'll set up training for small businesses and incubator how to be successful in America to own your own business and be very successful. I've taught well over 150 different businesses. Very proud to be a part of the International Coalition for Education, under Dr. Pat, I'm the chairman of the board and have been for over 33 years. Thank you very much.